Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Earthly Delights podcast. This week, we have John Paler, who is the author of the book, the, This War Within My Mind, the host of the Bipolar Battle podcast, and an award-winning mental health advocate. Welcome, John. Thanks for, thanks for doing this. Cool. Thanks for having me, Jim. Pleasure, pleasure. How are you doing today? What's the crack? Oh, I'm, I'm doing great today. It's uh, gorgeous out here in Colorado, in the USA, and... Um, yeah, it's going awesome today. <laughs> Beautiful. Happy to hear. Happy to hear. And I guess just to begin, do you mind telling us uh, or giving us your definition of bipolar? Because I think a lot of people are familiar with the word, from, uh, familiar with parts of it, but probably can't put in uh, a comprehensive definition when asked about it. So do you mind? Yes. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, Jim. Um, basically, you know, with bipolar disorder, so many people think of it, you know, it, it's a mood disorder. That's exactly the definition. It's a mood disorder. So people automatically assume when I feel good or I feel down, that's kind of a bipolar mood swing, right? Well, yeah. wrong. It's not. That's not the way it's defined as because with bipolar disorder, it's a diagnosable illness and there's different types of bipolar disorder and there's different extremes in terms of the intensity of it. And mm. basically what it is, there's two poles. You have the manic side and you have the depressive side. And with the manic side, you're revved up, you're starting projects, you're the life of the party, you're staying up for days at a, at a time. And you're just so energized. Like it's, it's, almost like you're going to explode because you have so much energy. And then the depressive side is completely opposite. You just don't want to move. You get so hopeless, so down. You can sleep and, you know, stay in bed for weeks at a time. Some people do, um, mm. especially if it's not treated correctly. And so you have these big extremes and that's what they are. I think people use it so uh, generally that it minimizes the reality of how extreme of an illness it is yeah. because I have bipolar type one and then there's a type two and then there's cyclothymic disorder or cyclothymia disorder and type one is characterized by the what I just told you the it's mm -hmm. basically the old definition of manic depression have you heard that yeah, that's common in, in the UK. That's commonly used, actually. Um, it is. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 See, the, before they switched over to bipolar disorder, um, it was manic depression, and that was type 1. That's kind of like the definition of type 1. Okay. And then are, are you guys familiar with the different types at all? I'm aware that there's, type, there's two types. I didn't know that there was potentially three. Yeah, the, the type 2 is... Um, uh, there's a, instead of manic, you become hypomanic and it's basically a lesser form of mania, mm -hmm. but it's not to say it's like easier to live through. I'm not saying that I'm saying in terms of the symptomology, because with mania, okay. with mania, you can get psychotic, you can get delusional. I mean, you can literally lose your mind to the point mm -hmm. where you have no, no clue who you are and what you're doing. Hypomania is more revved up like i was telling you but without those extreme extreme traits or symptoms the and generally speaking type two people can function to a better degree generally speaking um okay. so just to give you an idea about that and then cyclothymia i'm actually not as familiar with that since i've never i haven't really met too many people that have had it but it's more like a, a lesser form from type two in terms right. of the symptoms and they, they fluctuate more like you can fluctuate throughout the day um, or every couple days, if that makes mm. sense. Okay. And so you just to um, make it clear, you have type one, is that correct? Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. And I wanted to ask, um, because there's quite a big difference, you know, obviously we're from, I mean, Jim's from Ireland, but I'm from the UK. Um, we, uh, there's quite a big difference in that from our side of the pond um, <clears throat> diagnosis, typically the, the average age for diagnosis um, is around 19 years of age. Okay? Oh, 
Uh, yeah, it's, you're surprised. And the thing is, obviously, I know to do some research in America, it can be a lot earlier than that. In fact, I've seen some some um, people who've been diagnosed as early as three. Now, there's that's kind of caused a little bit of controversy from both sides because the the, the kind of the UK perspective of it is that. It, it could be potentially dangerous to um, diagnose such a young child with um, bipolar disorder and then medicate them because obviously their, their brains are still very young yeah. and they're still growing. Uh, however, the kind of American um, viewpoint, at least from what my research would show, is that, yes, however, the 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 better part of it, the better aspect is that once you've given it a name, it's a lot more easy to understand because a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of kids in England who maybe have bipolar disorder, because it's not diagnosed until a lot later, they just get treated as naughty children. They're just acting up, you know, it's yeah. just, they're, they're, they're misbehaved. Whereas yeah. maybe there's a bit more understanding in the American culture. If you have, if you put a name to it, then people go, Oh, okay. He's acting this way because of the bipolar disorder. What do you, what do you make of that? Do you think it's beneficial or um, how do you kind of see that controversy? Well, in terms of when you said 19, I was surprised, but actually the, if you look at statistics out here in America, the, um, uh, the average age of when someone's diagnosed over here is 25. Oh. So that's why when you said 19, I was like, wow, that's, I wonder, you guys must be diagnosing sooner than, than we are, mm. you know? And yeah. in terms of diagnosing, bipolar disorder in kids um or children it's kind of i'm kind of back and forth because when i was first diagnosed back in 1999 i was diagnosed right before my 21st birthday and right. at the time my my doctor told me she said they would not at that time diagnose anybody who is younger than a teenager because they said the mind still developing they might grow out of it you know because a lot of the symptoms that you see in bipolar disorder in kids or what they say they do mimics um other issues and it and it mimics just being a kid too yeah so for me i mean i'm a huge proponent of taking medication to uh manage my bipolar disorder but with kids I think it's a slippery slope, <laughs> you know, mm. I mean, personally, if I, if, you know, I have a son, I have a daughter too, and they say this is genetic and if yeah. they happen to get it, I would be very leery about putting a medication in their body to manage this. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah no of course i mean i was watching a documentary about it and um there were two brothers uh one was eight and i believe the other one was 13 or 14 and they had like a you know a, they were taking a lot of pills every day um to manage it um and they were going to um a special school that was better prepared but it, but it was still alarming just to see those kids kind of taking that medication every day i wanted to ask as well um you kind of briefly touched on it it's it would appear that um a lot of people who suffer with bipolar disorder also suffer with other kind of mental illnesses you know adhd for example maybe anxiety or addiction or other personality um disorders um do you think that's maybe a reason that diagnosis can be so slow um and so difficult to come by and and have you had any experience with that yeah yes i have um when i was first diagnosed the year or two before that, they had previously diagnosed me with, uh, what was it? The, um, I think it was it was cyclothymia disorder at first, mm -hmm. uh, when they first did a real quick overview of my history and everything, and then they they thought that it was, um, I you know I apologize I don't remember the name of the. Uh, diagnosis that's bipolar and schizophrenia uh-huh uh it's kind of the combination of symptoms between both of them they thought i had that and then they also thought i had adhd as well right and kind of what happened was i was in an adhd group talking to the other members and they all were saying their stories and I could relate and they could. And then all of a sudden they said, well, we never get that high energized, crazy energy sleeping, or I mean, staying up all night 
without sleeping. And so that's mm. when they finally were able to diagnose me as bipolar or having bipolar disorder. And the other thing too, you know, that's a, it's an interesting topic to explore because, you know, you have so many people uh, that are kind of chiming in like, well, what, what's, why does it take so long to get diagnosed and everything? Because over here, the statistic says that when somebody starts looking for an actual, you know, like there's an issue and they can yeah. they feel it, they see it. They're like, okay, I'm going to go get some help. The average time is 10 years to find wow. an actual diagnosis, which is I, really sad to me. Like I, I, I think we need to do better with that. I'm not sure exactly how that would look or how that would be. So I don't, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Th- thank you. I, I would yeah, love sure. to know what you think are, are the common misconceptions surrounding bipolar disorder. Well, uh, uh, that's a good question too, Jim, because there are a lot of different misconceptions. Like one of them is, oh, that, you know, the weather is so bipolar, you know, they use it as an adjective mm-hmm. and it minimizes the actual illness. It's like you were talking, Seb, at the beginning about um, when, uh, you know, oh, you're, you're having a mood, you know, your mood's up, your mood's down. Oh, you must have a little bipolar in you, you yeah. know, like when, yeah. anytime somebody u- uses it in a context that makes it not as serious as it really is, it makes it, uh, it minimizes the whole illness itself. And then it makes it harder for others to get help because then you have someone who wants to go out and get help and they're like, Oh, it's okay. You know, don't worry about it. You don't need, you're just, you have a little bipolar. Maybe that's it. That's what somebody Mm -hmm. told me when I was first diagnosed, I had, we actually had a doctor tell me that he was a doctor friend and he said, I've been working and he he had been working in the ER for 25 years. And he said, everybody has a little bipolar in them, John, you know, don't worry. You know, you have mood swings up and down, but that's not what it just is. Like with bipolar disorder, there are extreme mood swings and they don't always swing like throughout the day. A lot of people think, oh, throughout the day you get manic and depressed if you look at the diagnostic criteria of bipolar disorder in the DSM-5, it does not say anything about that, actually, about cycling throughout the day. And so in terms of the misconceptions of bipolar disorder, I think that's one of the biggest ones is about having a mood swing. Because the other thing, too, is throughout the day, this is something that does change throughout the day, is your motivation, your energy level, and your functionality. Those are Mm. huge components to bipolar disorder as well. It's not just a mood disorder. I mean, that's what it's classified as. But the other things, that's what makes it so difficult to live day to day with the illness is because your functionality is directly impacted. Does that all make sense? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. Um, I read in your blog, you said, an individual living with bipolar disorder does not always follow fall, follow in line with their own expectations and those of others. I was wondering, how do you deal with this disparity between expectation and reality? Or, or maybe should I rephrase that? Do you think people with bipolar need to be held uh, to different expectations? That's another good question, Jim, because... I've thought about that plenty of times, of course, (laughs) living with it, you know, throughout Mm -hmm. the years, Mm -hmm. my expectation growing up was, you know, you go to school, you go off to college or um, university, and then you get a good job and you get married, you have kids, you work for what, 20, 25 years and you retire. And that's kind of the way the expectation was for me. And I actually had to kind of break through that mold a little bit because, well, actually a big bit because my bipolar is so severe, it's hard for me to function day to day. I can't actually take on a job like eight to five each day Mm -hmm. and work Mm -hmm. like that. So the whole expectation that I need to go to work Monday through Friday, eight to five, I, I had to come to terms 
with that. And that was really hard, Jim, for me, because I'm very, that's imagine. another thing grow, growing up is being hardworking, being very, you know, loyal and consistent. And this was com- basically the opposite. So it really, it really threw me for a loop in terms of what, how I was going to, um, take reality of how bipolar is and fit it into the expectations of how I need to live my own life. And I finally came to the point where I just can't have expectations, those old ones. I have to create new expectations, but I'm still going to, I'm going to hold myself to the highest expectations that I was before. It just, I guess the word would be paradigm. Like it was, it's a different mm-hmm. paradigm paradigm from before I had bipolar disorder and now. So everything had to be restructured. And, and when I say that it, it wasn't one of those like overnight, Oh, weekend things. I mean, this is over a course of a few years that it took me to figure this out and to feel comfortable with mm-hmm. it as well. You talk about, um, Sorry, do, do, do some research. You talk about the, the misconceptions and kind of the how it, you, you fluctuate. You know, you have the the hyper, the manic um, states, and then you have the more depressive states. And then I think people who maybe are maybe slightly more aware of, uh, of bipolar disorder would be aware that you have these different states. Um, but some of us, I think maybe think of these manic states as almost positive, right? That, oh, I, I would love to be super energetic and to have this high self-esteem and and this amazing confidence. I think I, I could do with that. But then actually you do a bit more reading into it and it's not as positive. Could you just speak a bit more to that, please? Sure thing, Seb, definitely. Um, I think exactly what you said, people, that is another misconception that by bip- or the manic part of bipolar disorder is all like running through the fields with of flowers with butterflies and smiling, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, frolicking and stuff. Yeah. And, and, and at first, to be honest, it actually is like that for the first maybe three days for me, at least three or four days. But mm-hmm. if you've, if you've ever stayed up all night and the next day, uh, you know, tried to function, usually you, mm-hmm. you're pretty exhausted, right? You know, if you pull an yeah. all nighter, you're like, oh man, I need to get some sleep. But when, when, when you have mania and you sleep or it, you stay up all night and the next day, you just keep going. You're like, oh yeah, bring it, bring it, bring it. And you do that for three or four days. And for me, that's when I start to get uh, what they call delusional, start hallucinating. And I, as I was saying at the beginning, I kind of, lose my mind, so to speak. I don't know what's mm-hmm. really going on. It's hard to d- determine what reality is, what's going on. So yes, I still have that energy, but it's like an anxious, um, irritable energy that you can't contain. And it's almost like your mind is trying to figure out a way to cope with all this energy. And so I've I've seen figures, I've seen the devil... I've seen spirits, demons, Mm. mine are very faith based. And I know Mm -hmm. that's not normal always, but, um, I, you know, I've met a couple other people that have had the same thing when I was going through a manic episode in 2016, I believe, or 2015, I thought I was best friends with the Pope. You know, I thought I was, I literally thought I was best friends with him. And I thought if I could get to him and talk to him, I could help them figure out Christianity or uh, Catholic Catholicism. It was just, so that gives you an example. (laughs) Yeah. And and I was, you know, did a bit of research. You don't realize how many um, celebrities, you know, are are diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I think probably the most famous nowadays would be Kanye West, but in in England, maybe not so well known over in the States, but in England, Stephen Fry is a really big um, speaker on bipolar disorder. Uh, Robbie Williams is another one. And, but they all, what they, what they had in common, which I found really interesting is um, they all uh, are really high functioning when they're in their manic states. Okay. And it says that, that it gives them an extra boost of creativity. And quite frankly, it's kind of what they're known for, right? As in, in the sense of, the reason that we know Kanye West is this super creative um, producer and rapper, a lot of it may be down to their bipolar, his bipolar disorder. And 
a lot of them given the opportunity were asked if they could you know they could press a button and get rid of their bipolar disorder and just kind of lead a more normal life would they do it and a lot of them not everyone but a lot of people said that they wouldn't that they'd actually choose to live with them with the disorder because they think it it really is a big part of who they are and they're happy to take the the de- more depressive states in order to have some of the manic states which give them this extra juice of creativity and so on um w- would you agree with that sentiment or would you be the one who would press the button and get rid of it if you could well you know, in terms of that, I, it's like two questions, I think, because mm-hmm. the whole pushing the button or not is one. And then the uh, whole topic that you're talking about with creativity is another, because okay. with creativity and bipolar disorder, I think that's another misconception with bipolar disorder. And that is, if you have it, then you're creative. Right. And that's not, not everybody is creative, it just brings out the creativity more in you if that's something you like to do. Because I know a lot of people that have bipolar disorder and they they just, they, they aren't, they don't have a creative bone in their body. Like they just don't yeah. enjoy drawing, art, sculpt, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And the other thing too that I think leads to the misconception about bipolar disorder is exactly what, what, what's going on with some of these um actors actresses people in the spotlight because to say for them to say that they are only creative when they're manic i don't i've never understood that to be honest like maybe those three right. or four days that i told you that when i that first start and i'm manic i can mm-hmm. do i do start projects and so forth but after that if you serious if you get seriously manic I can't function. I'm not in my right state of mind, let alone trying to start a project or create something. So the people that say that they need it to be creative, I don't really know if, um, if they have, I mean, I'm not a doctor and I don't want to, I'm not trying to diagnose or misdiagnose anybody, but it just leads me to question myself. If they're saying things like this, well, if they're saying that they need it to, or or do they have, do they have it? Or is it a severe case? Because I know with hypomania, you can do that. But with mania, if you, if they're truly saying mania by the definition, I don't see how that's possible, but if they're, but see, that's another thing too. People, they interchange mania and hypomania and they're completely different. So they might be saying, hypomania which i could understand more because uh-huh. with my experience with mania not at all and in terms of the button i you know i don't know i really i've never under i've never been able to figure out what i would do or what i wouldn't do because i am right. here with it right now i'm living the way i am right now so i don't know to <laughs> yeah it's a, that's, that's a big question it's a hard hypothetical for sure yeah um that you were talking i think at the very very beginning you said something you said that you're a big advocate for taking medication uh and that you that's what's something that you definitely do in, in your personal life and that's your choice uh, how i was doing a lot of research and there was a lot of them you know i think um lithium is a very um is one of the kind of best medications quote unquote but a lot of people um are really scared to take lithium because once you kind of take it you can't get off it in fact if you the study shows that if you kind of take it and then get off, it actually can make things worse. So it's kind of a life choice that if you take this, you're on it forever. And people are kind of scared of that cognitive suppression oh, so yeah. that you almost become, you know, th- this image of like a zombie type thing. Um, w- would you agree with that? What do you think, what is your stance on, on medication and, and whether you should take it or not with the bis- bipolar disorder? Well, in terms of medication uh, or not, I'm, I am, like I said, I'm a huge proponent of taking it. I think that uh, it's a very personal choice too, though. And I think if when you're first diagnosed, I think you owe it to yourself as a person to at least explore that route. Because I know some people say, well, I'm just not going to go on medication. Well, don't I don't I don't think it's good to disregard any treatment until you know a little bit more about it. And in terms of what you were saying, Seb, about lithium and when people go off it they get worse 
you know, everybody reacts differently to medications too. You know, let's say you have bipolar, I have bipolar and you give me lithium and then you lithium, it might not even help you at all, but it might stabilize me completely. Right. And then if we're on it for the same amount of time for let's say three or four weeks, I might be able to stop it and you too, but you might have some sort of withdrawal from it and I might not at all. So it kind of, in terms of medication, I don't think people should just kind of toss it to the side and say, no, I'm not even going to try it because I know there's the anti-psychiatry movement going on right now and pill shaming to use medication and everybody's against it that, that I generally talk to, but I just think it yeah. would be good to keep an open mind because if you look at it, the medications, at least over here in the U S I don't know how it is over there, but mm -hmm. when medications first came out decades ago, people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and so forth were able to start living outside of the walls of mental institutions and psychiatric yeah. facilities. So there's a reason for that. Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. Uh, John, you, you mentioned, or I read in your blog that it took you close to a decade before you found the right combination of medication that you could actually tolerate with. Could you talk us through that process of you going, Oh, well, I've, this works, but then, but then this happens and I can't tolerate that on a short or long-term basis and I need to change this or. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I can definitely talk about that. I mean, in terms of my 10 years of, you know, trying to figure this out, it, it, it was exhausting. That was probably one of the most exhausting things was trying to find the right treatment. It's, it's almost like a treatment fatigue <laughs> where you keep trying and trying and trying and you have hope and you just keep going. But I would try a medication and then I would have a side effect, like uh, whatever it would be, a heart palpitation or something like that, that would be very uncomfortable for me. And I, I thought to myself, or I told myself early on, that I would not allow myself to just kind of settle for a medication. And if I felt like I was going to be a zombie, or I wouldn't be able to function, that to the to the degree that I would want to, I would not mm. stay on it. I would talk to my doctor and, re and mm. realize too, like when I talk about getting off meds and so forth, I've always done it with, uh, under the supervision of a doctor. So yeah, in terms of finding my way, I would, you know, I, I cycled quite a bit those first five years, five or six years. And so we were constantly changing meds. And they just, they weren't taking effect. And I was constantly in the hospital. I was hospitalized for, you know, a couple times, a couple months at a time. And, um, and I did other therapies that weren't conventional. Like I tried ECT treatments, electroconvulsive okay. therapy. Yeah. And I've, so when I say that I've, been trying for the past 10 years. I really have like, I've tried all sorts of therapies, EMDR, DBT group therapy, all sorts of things. And so it was a tiring process, but finally I came to the point where I wasn't so like my highs and my lows weren't so extreme. I was able to function more like my episodes were less and the time between episodes was growing longer and longer. So mm. that's kind of how I realized that, oh, the meds that I'm taking, they're working and I can tolerate the side effects. So that's kind of, that's kind of how I finally found it was that kind of, I could tell because of the remission of it. And it was actually really weird at first because I was not used to feeling stable. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was really crazy to think like, or not crazy, but you know, I don't like that word, but it was just, um, I don't know what the word is right now, but, um, shocking probably yeah, shocking, assume. disconcerting. <laughs> yeah. So. 
Uh, John, I was reading um, <clears throat> probably one of the scariest statistics that I came across was that um, bipolar disorder had the highest um, fatality rate among all the mental illnesses um, that uh, people were most driven to uh, unfortunately taking their own lives if they had bipolar disorder and those 10 years it's a long journey you know and, and I'm, I'm sure there must have been moments of despair did you ever get to those those really really dark and um, places or did you always maintain a kind of a glimmer of hope and, and some sort of positivity I tried to always have a little bit of hope and to move on and so forth and keep going. There were a couple times where I did um, not attempt suicide. Mm -hmm. So I did end up going to the hospital and, you know, they pumped my stomach a bunch and all that. And I had to get treated in their facilities. And I, it was about three times that happened. One of the times before I got really low, my doctor called um, the the police, the cops, and yeah. they came over to the my house at the time. And I always remember that because I was getting re ready upstairs and I looked out the back and I saw three police officers jump over and run towards my house. And I wasn't aware they were coming. So I didn't really, at this time, I didn't know what was happening. I just... I was extremely depressed, extremely mm -hmm. down. I did have a lot of suicidal ideation and I opened mm -hmm. up the front door and I remember that cop, he pulled his gun on me and he just said, get down on your knees now. And I had no clue what was going on, remember? Uh, and he didn't even tell me until I got to the hospital. Um, right. He said, oh, your doctor called. Cause I was, cause I couldn't, I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't know what I was in trouble for. So yeah so it was pretty dark some of those times <laughs> yeah thanks for sharing that john uh, and being so candid you know it's never nice to hear but i think it's an important to accept that suicide or suicide attempts are unfortunately a very tragic reality but a reality nonetheless um <clears throat> i guess my question is what do you think is um you someone who has maybe has experience obviously what do you think as a society maybe like not so much talking about the medication but maybe something that we could all do as a society that could maybe help um kind of decrease these uh these statistics and make it so it's not so despairing i don't know some sort of understanding do you think maybe conversations like these like jim said holding people with bipolar disorders to maybe um a different standard is there anything that we, as a society we could do to to help that um you know, I think awareness, like you were just saying, Seb, Seb is that mm -hmm. uh, having conversations with people, opening up their minds, you know, hopefully the, getting people talking. I think the real th big thing I've been finding in the past few months or so with some of my advocacy work is in the U.S. going to the state level and the um and the government basically to start opening n opening up more doors to uh, facilities and for people to get treated because over here uh, over here the resources that we have do not take care of the demand like we right. need more support in terms of helping a diagnosis getting the treatments getting the medications getting help with therapy like all those things so i think it's what we're doing like even right now is awesome mm. this is i love doing this because we get it i get it i'm i've just met you guys and you guys are awesome mm. and you know your audience is going to listen and hopefully they'll take something away from it and yeah. other people too and in terms of the expectation like Jim was asking about that, I think that, um, you know, it's hard to have expectations because with bipolar disorder there, it is an illness. And so to some degree you don't have control, but at the other, I, for me, I take extreme personal responsibility for what I do because I know now I have been able to find ways to prevent or uh, lessen the severity of my episodes. So 
I'm in control of that, the things I do on a daily basis. So I think those expectations should be the same for everybody, but there needs to be an expectation that if you want to take responsibility, you have to take responsibility and you do that by managing it on a daily basis. You follow a treatment plan, you follow through with what you're doing. Like you, there does need to be some accountability. You can't just let somebody just, okay, do whatever you want, you know, and there's no responsibility, you know? Mm. Yeah. T- thanks, John. We, we really do appreciate the, the candid manner in which you're expressing yourself. Uh, it is something that we try to do on the podcast. We really do try to talk about topics that, you know, are often quote unquote taboo. And I know that you mentioned that hypersexuality is a bit of a t- taboo topic within the bipolar community um and i i read on your blog that you said a majority of bipolar type one experience hypersexuality can you talk about the impact on this and how it can, uh, the impact it can have on relationships and and how do you uh reduce the effects of these hypersexual episodes okay yeah um that's a it's an awesome topic jim because a lot of people don't i mean people already have an issue talking about sex anyways <laughs> you know yeah I, I think people for some reason they're uncomfortable i know if it even comes up around my parents they you know they turn beet red like oh my god <laughs> why, <is this? laughs> why are we even discussing this like what is happening <laughs> but but it is real when it comes to type one especially like you said and from my experience too it it can destroy relationships because hypersexuality is something where it makes sense if you look at the whole biology of bipolar disorder, because, you know, it, it depre- in depression, you're down, you're low, you don't want to do anything, your sex drive is kaput, you don't, you, I mean, touching, feel, you just don't want to have any of that, you kind of like cringe, like, oh gosh, I just, I don't want any of that. And then when you come up to the mania, you have all this excitement, you have all this energy, Instead of having, you know, Mm. sex once a week, you want to have sex three times a day, you know? Mm. And so, and it can destroy a relationship if you don't talk to your partner and let them know that, yeah, my feelings, my sexual desires and feelings shoot through the roof and I do want to have sex a lot more and I want to try this or I want to try that, you know? So it does kind of, it can throw your partner for a loop. I know it. if they're not prepared for it, it's kind of a scary thing, I'm sure, from their end, uh, from our, yeah, what? And John, sorry, just to jump in quickly, um, from, you, I saw in the blog, just so we didn't miss out, um, is it correct that I read that it can also potentially even change the orientation, and even um, if you're, you know, you might be super monogamous, but actually then you, during these episodes, you're almost kind of uncontrollable, is that correct, or have I mis- kind of read that? No, that's, that's true, I mean, you can, you know, during uh, the course of just living with bipolar disorder, you you can be monogamous, you can just be like, okay, here I am, I'm you know, I'm married. And then when you get hypersexual, you can be like, man, I want to sleep with this person. Oh my gosh, she looks hot or he looks hot. I want to, or they look hot, you know, like I want to, mm-hmm. you know, what do you guys say over there? I want to shag them, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and so it's kind of, and then in terms of um, the orientation, yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're that revved up and that high, then everybody looks appealing sometimes. Like some people do their orientation does change. Like they might be heterosexual and then they, and maybe bisexual or whatever orientation, you know, it's just, um, Mm -hmm. yeah. (laughs) Does that make sense? Thanks, John. Yeah, of course. Of course. We are, one of the lines uh, on your website or your blog that I really appreciate, um, you say, bipolar disorder is infamous for turning our minds against ourselves. And I know this might be a bridge into your book, but can you talk me through um, maybe how you have changed or improved your relationship with your mind? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, when when I was first learning about all this stuff with bipolar disorder, I didn't really understand how it would change things. And the whole idea that it does turn us against ourselves 
it's pretty apparent when you're depressed and you're suicidal. Uh, it's very unnerving to think when you're in that mind frame that you want to take your own life. I mean, we're, aren't we one of the, I think we're the only mammal that does that, I think is, yeah. you know, suicide. And it's very, it's very scary. And so for me, I have finally come to the point where I know that's a possibility in my mind at some point down the road that could happen, but I'm taking, I take such a proactive role in my uh, treatment plan and managing each day that I know it's not, if it does happen, it won't be as uh, severe. So for me, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that, yeah, that's part of my mind, but it's something that I can manage and I can, you know, with the right, with my, myself personally, I can do it. And if I, the support around me as well, does that answer your question this time? I don't know if it, you, <laughs> yeah, no, don't worry. Trust me. You're, you're like, I mean, oh, you're yeah, a fountain no, of knowledge it. in this field compared to what we're, <laughs> what, sure. we're what we're uh-huh. used to. But, um, another thing that you mentioned actually is, um, going all the way back to the start is that you said that, um, it's genetic, right. That it gets passed down your DNA yeah. and, uh, and obviously you're your father. Um, how do you manage that worry? Because I mean, it must be a worry. And the other thing, sorry, it's just like, kind of like a two-part question. The other thing is that I, I was watching this documentary and um, this this guy said that his dad was um, had bipolar disorder, but he didn't show any symptoms until he was 40. And then later on, I think maybe maybe 10 years or so after, he uh, eventually took his own life. But oh, man. I, what I don't understand is how, how can you um, kind of live a normal life, so to speak, quote unquote, up until a certain age and then all of a sudden show it. I would have thought that if you're born with it, it would be there from the offset. Or is that just another misconception? I think that's another misconception too, Seb, but I think also it's just the way that science has evolved because when I was first diagnosed, it was that uh, it was a chemical genetic thing. Like if your parents or somebody in your family has it, then you'll have Mm it. But now studies are showing that they that you're predisposed for bipolar disorder and it right. predisposed like another illness if you're predisposed okay. to it it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it you know the the mm-hmm. environmental factors have to be there to um have it start so like for me okay. i it makes sense in my situation because i went to college and that's when mine hit and a very stress, usually it's a very stressful event or you're in an, a very stressful environment or trauma or crime or something happens to the person. Mm-hmm. And then it like triggers something in your chemistry and then you, mm-hmm. it, the disorder kind of takes over. Right. Okay. And, and, and that makes more sense now. Um, and so, so it can be triggered and are you, what, obviously I'm sure you're worried about your kids, but is there certain things that you're like looking out for, or you're more aware of that? Oh, are they acting up? Or are you just like, look, I'm just going to have to take this day by day. And if they have it, unfortunately it's just mm-hmm. something we'll have to manage. Well, it, like I, you know, I think with my kiddos at first, I was pretty scared about it. To be honest, I w- when I had my daughter first, I just thought, man, I'm going to pass this on to her, but it's not necessarily a uh, given or that, you know, that it's really going to happen. I mean, she might not even get it or she might not have symptoms or whatnot. And then the same thing happened with my son. But now I'm at the point where I do look a little bit mm-hmm. and thing. I think I'm more, you know, since I've been through it, life myself with this illness, I'm able to see things clearer when it comes to that. So I'm not overly like, I don't over dramatize any sort of things that they do, but I, it does keep, I keep it in the back of my mind because as a kid, I exhibited different behaviors than other kiddos. And actually that's what I'm writing my second book about right now is my about my life. And, uh, that's, those are one of the things, but back to the question with my kiddos, 
you know, if something does happen and they end up having it and or they start showing symptoms, who better to help them out than me? Yeah, of you course, know? of course. Myself, I mean, they'll ha- they'll have doctors, they'll have therapists, but they're I mean, they only can do so much. I see them want what like for an hour during the whole month and how many other hours are we by ourselves? I can be there for them. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. Like you said, who better, who better, um, before we get on to your work that you've done in the field, because you're an incredibly busy man, like you said, two books, you've got a podcast as well. Um, just to mention a few of the things that you're doing, but, but just that one of the last questions I have in terms of the psyche, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get into it. As someone who maybe, well, not maybe is very ignorant to bipolar disorder. Didn't really know much about it. When you have, um, these, uh, when you have the mania or even the the depression, the depressive states and you do things that maybe are slightly reckless or like, you know, for example, in the hypersexuality example, let's say that, you know, you're, you're, you're cheating on your long-term partner. Okay. Is that, how is it, is it like your brain takes over? Do you know that you're doing something that you wouldn't normally do? Or does it in that moment seem completely um, logical and normal for you to be doing whatever it may be? It's to me, it's, completely logical at that moment like when i when i with the pope when i was telling you about him being my friend Mm -hmm. i wasn't thinking like oh i'm out of it or whatever i'm like he's my friend he's my buddy i need to talk to him you know right and if you know whatever sexual exploits or whatever that you're having or people have had with it like me personally i'm like this feels right it feels good. I'm going to, you know, there's nothing wrong. There's no reper. You don't think of repercussions. It's almost like mm-hmm. a child's mind where you're, you mm-hmm. don't really think ahead of time to be like, well, gosh, there's, this can destroy a relationship or, you know, this can hurt um, a loved one. You don't think yeah. those things until after your mind starts settling down and you realize, oh my gosh, this is what I did. How could, you know, yeah. Okay, yeah, that rings a bell. I mean, when I was Stephen Fry in one of his many interviews that he's done, I'm, I'm, are you aware of, of Stephen Fry? I all? am, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. yeah so he's a really big speaker on it and um, you know, so eloquent. But he um, he said that when he used to do some of these incredible, like, what well, um, fascinating things, you know, one of the things he did when he was very young was he stole the credit cards from all of his pa- parents' friends. And then he just lived the high life in London, buying these really expensive suits, going to the Savoy and so on and so forth. He said that when he did it, he just felt like he was at the center of the universe and that yeah. nothing else mattered. It was just all like this um, mania, like it's just completely about him and everything else was just mad that we'll deal with that later. I'm at the complete yeah. center of the universe. And that kind of rang a bell when you were talking, um, saying, yeah, about it's that, a very you know. egocentric feeling that mm. about me, 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 you know? So, yeah. And, um, I just want to, you know, uh, before we wrap up, I want to ask you about your work. So could you talk to us about the first book that you've um, published and obviously then the second book that you are writing now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The the first book I wrote, uh, it's called This War Within My Mind, and it's based on my blog, The Bipolar Battle. And I really wanted, I created it as almost like a little, hand, a hand, <clears throat> excuse me, a handbook no or a framework to help people that are newly diagnosed or people that have had it for, you know, their veterans to the illness to give them mm-hmm. new ideas. So it's kind of a, it's a, based on my perspective, a patient's perspective of bipolar disorder and how to treat it and how to manage it. And I'm really big on being a warrior with uh, fighting any mental illness, whether, you know, bipolar or not, but I think we're all warriors. And I think that's Mm -hmm. a good mentality to have because to live through this each day, it is a battle. And that's why I call it the bipolar battle because I fight it each day, the bipolar battle. And so Mm -hmm. that's my first book. And the second book um, is, I I don't like to use the word memoir, but it's like an autobiography of my life. So people can get an idea of what my life's been like living with this. So if they have Mm -hmm. questions, you know, I, I hope it would illuminate some things for people or whatnot. Yeah. And, and in the, you said you mentioned that you do a podcast called the battle with bipolar, correct? Yeah. The bipolar battle. 
the bipolar battle sorry um and that's available on apple spotify all of that jazz yeah yeah right correct yes uh, and is that just yourself would you have like is that just yourself talking about it on a daily basis how, how does that kind of go for people who may be interested yeah. in, in signing up um it, it's just little blips of like five ten minute messages for myself okay about bipolar disorder how i manage and i'm trying to do like maybe twice a week if i can and um I'll have interviews every one once in a while. Like I have one mm-hmm. on Monday, but I generally am not going to do that as much. Right. Okay. Perfect. Well, I mean, guys, for anyone who obviously wants to find out more about John, um, and you know, or wants to buy his books, this is all on your website. Is that correct as well? Can you just right. give us the name of your website for anyone who wanted yeah. to kind of search it's, that up? It's just the bipolar battle.com perfect i mean it couldn't be easier than that yeah. com. so yeah. there it all is for anyone who wants to um um find out more information on this fascinating subject john before we let you go um could you just give us we have the segment how to you keep your shit together could you just um keep could you just kind of let us know what it is that you do i'm sure it'd be fascinating just to see what you do on a daily basis just to kind of stay on top of it all oh yeah yeah definitely yeah i mean each day i i try to just focus on basic survival needs. (laughs) Like I try to wake up at the same time each day, go to bed at the same time each night. I eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then snacks in between. I work out every day Mm -hmm. and I have to do that. That's something uh, I can't stress enough for people, you know, that are like, Oh, I can't get into it. Well, the first like 30 to 60 days when I was got back to it was horrible. But now it's such a routine that if I don't do it, it feels weird. Like it's such an ingrained habit. So I do that as well. I write each day. I play with my son. We hang out, draw, watch his YouTube, play his Roblox. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And then uh, I like to get outside, but because of the whole pandemic, I, I'm in the high risk group. So I usually just go out on the patio and do that. And I work out at, at, here at my apartment, we have a little two bedroom apartment. And in the corner, I have a, a bench, adjustable dumbbells, a pull up bar and a fold up bike. And I can do everything that I need right in here. So that's probably oh, a nice little setup you've got there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great stuff. Well, I mean, I think we could all definitely do that. I mean, ha- keeping a healthy lifestyle can't ever be a bad thing, right? Right. So that's definitely something that we could all learn from if we're not doing it already. But um, I just want to thank you, John, so much um for this. I think it's been really, yeah, really yeah. illuminating. Yeah. Thanks, Seth um, and Jim, for having me. You guys have been great. No, man. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much. And guys, really like we said. It. If anyone wants to find out more information about John, obviously we'll put it in the show notes, but it is the, the bipolar battle.com and there's everything there. There's the blog, the podcast, um, you can find out information about the books. Um, so it's all there, the bipolar battle.com, um, really interesting stuff. And I really just wish the best for you, man. I hope it all goes well. Thanks. You too, Seb. You too, Jim. (laughs) Thank you so much. Yeah. Guys, if you guys, thank you guys if you've liked this podcast please like rate it and subscribe it and if you think anyone might find this inf- uh, information useful um or, or interesting indeed just please pass it on it really helps a lot and um, thank you so much talk to you soon guys stay safe bye